Welcome to the Snetterton 300 circuit that brings the Intelligent Money British GT Championship into the second half of its 2023 campaign. We've had some excellent racing already this season with a variety of winners across both GT3 and GT4, but now it's time for the attention to turn to point scoring and those at the top of the championship to build on a strong campaign. We've got 34 cars racing here across two 60-minute races. Short, sharp action as the day goes on, and it's set to be another exciting instalment in this year's championship. Welcome along everyone then to Snetterton for the start of the second half of the season in the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. The sun is shining. We've got a big grid of GT machinery starting now to pull into position and a big crowd on hand as well, ready to enjoy the nice weather, but hopefully two really exciting 60 minute races. It's always a real highlight of the season, this one for me. We usually get some really good racing here at Snetterton and with a couple of interesting looking grids, I think we could be in for a particularly exciting day. Well, we'll talk about the way in which they're going to line up on that grid in a moment or two. But for now, let's head down from myself, Andy McEwen, in the commentary box to Bryn Lucas and my co-commentator, Joe Osborne, who find themselves right in the thick of the action. Yeah, thanks, Andy. It's a blisteringly sunny day here at Snetterton and uh, an unusual track, really a different track to many that we come to. It's very narrow. It's almost three miles, 12 turns. What are the, the characteristics that make this place so unusual, Joe? See, as you've touched, we've got a lot of corners for the length of the track, so naturally quite tight and mm. twisty. We have a real mix of corners. We've got the standard slow speed hairpins, medium speed and high speed, but also change of direction. So there's every sort of corner, which is an engineer's nightmare to try and get that car set up. We are also back to our sprint format. So today we have two one hour sprint races, so only 60 minutes to get up the field, whereas obviously the two hours or three hours, feels like you've got a bit more time to make those places up. It's normally punchy at the start. But it means that you can right the wrong, doesn't it? If you have a terrible first race, it means you can sort of reset ready for race two. But how does it play into the driver's minds then? Because as you say, not long in between races, if, you, if you've been the car, you're in a bit of a, a situation for race two. Yeah, if you have a big enough crash in race one, you're naturally going to miss race number two, which is almost the worst possible weekend you can imagine. Although the sprint races are less points per race, because there's two of them, it's a big point scoring weekend. So mm. those guys at the front of the championship have got to really bear that in mind. Whereas if you're not in the championship hunt, it's your time to get on the front foot and ask those questions of those other guys. And a really strong field again, GT3 and GT4. You can see the cars that are making their way onto the grid for this one. I'm going to catch up with you in a few, a few minutes, of course, but let's speak to Mike Simpson here. Mike, it's great to see you. It's great to see you back out in a racing car as well. Uh, former factory driver for Ginetta, you've taken up a slightly different role ahead of motorsport, but you're back out in the car now. What's the reasoning behind you getting back out there? Yeah, I mean, my role has always been try and win on Sunday, sell on Monday. Um, and after the LMP1 finish, you know, I sort of hung my helmet up and focused on the business. Um, but yeah, we, we wanted more performance, a bit more reliability. Toro Verde have been doing a great job, but we, we wanted a combined program where we can help each other, you know, put more heads together is better than one and um, since since Donington cars have been back we've all well got on the cars had a great test and the results are speaking for themselves we're, we're right back at the sharp end so you know raceway are on there you know, right at the front pole for this one so the, the G56 is a is a mega car and um, you know for me just all the effort that's been put in by Jeanette to Toro Verde Raceway I'm, I'm just pleased to see us at the sharp end it's great so it's great to see you back out let's see what you can do this weekend thanks very much there to Mike let's head then to pole position just saw Dan Harper there uh, in the back of the shot just trying to get involved a little bit. He's looked really, really solid since coming into the championship this year in the BMW and a, kind of a meteoric rise uh, for him. A man who's very used to this championship was here at the very, very first time that uh, SRO had the uh, British GT and you're starting in a very, very strong position this time, Sean. Yeah, happy with being on the front row again, um, especially off the back of Donington. So anybody who thought we fluked Donington pole, um, Obviously, we inherited a place from James here, but uh, nevertheless, a really strong performance from, from the Barwell Lamborghini team. So, uh, obviously, eyes forward, hope, hoping for a fast, clean start. This, this actual weekend represents the halfway point in the season, and yourself and Sandy probably aren't where you want to be in the championship. You're some 20-odd points back there, I think. So, you've got to make some up, and here's a really good time to start doing it. Yeah, it's a perfect opportunity. Um, yeah, can't, can't disagree with that really. Uh, we would like to be a little bit further up, but reminding ourselves the quality of the championship this year is, is just at an obscene level. Uh, everybody's working 
driving really hard, the teams, the drivers. So, um, you know, we're, we're still in it. And uh, I think we are just looking for that really good, solid race result off the back of a P2 at Silverstone 500. We, we need to get some more points, good points. Absolutely. Well, good luck today. Thanks, Sean. There you go. Sean Bauf there starting from pole position. I think Joe's around. He's got... Uh, P2, I think he's with uh, James Cotting. I'm just trying to find out where he is right now. I can see Sandy Mitchell just over my shoulder. So I'm not sure where Joe is, but hopefully we can throw to him. If not, it's back to you, Andy. Yeah, thanks, Bryn. Uh, Joe, uh, wandering up and down the grid then to catch up with some more of our drivers. We heard there from Sean Balf, who, as Bryn mentioned, uh, was here right when it all kind of started. British GT itself has been around for a long time, but it was 20 years ago this year that SRO took charge of the championship and really kind of laid the foundations for this spectacular championship that we enjoy today. Right then, back down to the grid. Uh, Joe Osborne, who have you found? Yeah, thank you, uh, Andy. So, uh, James, we spoke earlier. Obviously, you qualified on pole, mega lap, nearly five tenths clear of the competition, but a penalty with effectively from contact in free practice two with a GT4 car has put you back five places. I mean, I've raced in both classes. I've managed to not have contact. I, I personally feel in the GT3 class, it's a little bit more on you to make the, the pass clean, but obviously you probably don't feel like that. How do you view the incident in FP2? And then how are you going to make amends from obviously having to start all the way back here when you should be on pole position? Uh, yeah, look, uh, totally with you, Joe. You know, we should. it is our responsibility to get past the GT4 cars. You know, the MSA or MS Motorsport UK is very big on race with respect today. And uh, racing with respect is a two-way street. You know, it's we respect them. GT4 cars have got to respect us as well. As you know, I come from a background of racing cars that are worth 10 times what these cars are worth. And we're very used to going through the pack and getting away, you know, getting through cleanly. So um, uh, I just think it's, it's probably some of the GT4 cars maybe need to take a step back and say, actually, yeah, they're doing what they need to do. But we've got to remember they are coming through, especially if you've got blue flags waved and flashed in front of you and the car is there alongside you. Because at the end of the day, in my position, I'm not saying it was anyone's fault. I think it was a racing incident. Um, but it is one of those things that happens. And, uh, you know, yeah, sometimes we just got to respect each other a bit more. Uh, look, it's highly regrettable. I hate the fact that it happened yesterday. Uh, obviously, it's put us here. But then again, we always had the two points from Silverstone, which, uh, again, makes me look like I'm always hitting GT4 cars. But, I, you know, I did not know he was there when that happened. So we always knew at some point we might get one more point and that we might have a five, a five grid penalty. So a one hour race where we've already got a 10 second penalty for our Donington win, this is probably the best place to do it. So tactically, you know, I'm in a positive mind frame about it. That we've just got to stay out of trouble as ever and uh, just do the best we can. And obviously we've shown we've got the pace. I think Johnny had an unlucky qualifying session um, in terms of track position and a bit of track limits. But uh, through the weekend, our sectors have been really good. And yeah, look, we've just got to be there at the end and make the most of this weekend and just try and take as many points away as we can. Awesome. Thank you, James. I really think this guy's to watch. Should have been on pole. Championship leader. I think it's going to get pretty spicy in this third row of the grid. Back to you, Andy. Yeah, thanks, Joe. That's a very good point. He is also the highest placed car on the grid that has uh, that extra time to be served, uh, the compensation time in the pit stops. Ten seconds extra added on uh, to that car's uh, pit stop time uh, because it won last time at Donington Park. Now then, uh, another contender potentially within GT3 is going to be uh, the uh, McLaren that will be driven in the second half of the race by Marcus Clutton. It is started, though, by Matt Topham, new to Enduro Motorsport. Matt will be starting seventh, and his experienced teammate Marcus Clutton catches up now with Bryn Lucas. Yeah, thanks, Andy. So, Marcus, a different teammate for you, making his debut in GT3, but Matt Topham knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Oh, definitely. You know, he's proven that in GT4, that he knows what he's doing. And, you know, strong qualifying yesterday to, to P4, um, puts in a great position for the first race. Um, so, yeah, he's doing a fantastic job. Bit of a different atmosphere for me, myself. Obviously, I worked with Morgan for three years, solid. And, uh, but he's took on the challenge, doing a mega job, and I'm really enjoying it. Have you had to change much with the car to, to fit Matt's style more? No, not at all. We've not had to change anything. He's just jumped in the car, got on with it, uh, listened to everything I've said, and, and that's proven. You know, he's, he's done it, like I said, he did a great job yesterday, and hopefully we can improve on that now. Great stuff. Well, good luck. Thank you very much. Let's just take a little wander as well. If we take a wander down the grid here, uh, Guy, if you can come with me, we'll just have a quick look at, uh, because the grid is now clearing from the many, many fans that have made it on. It's a beautifully glorious day, and you can just see stretching out here at Sneddon, all the way down there, the GT3 cars, and then they blend seamlessly with the GT4s. And I'm going to try and catch up with the GT4 pole sitter, 
the whistles and alarms have, have gone off here telling us we need to start clearing the, the grid. So it's always quite an excitable time when you see all the drivers going through their, their sort of the last processes of getting ready. You know, the team with them just making sure the drivers are all set. And you've got to walk a really long way back here to get to Andrew Howard in the Beach Dean. Aston Martin it is a long way back from the start. Let's just keep heading all the way down. You get a real sense of how far back we have to go. It's a very long way, but don't worry too much. I've got my, my good shoes on. The engine's firing up. It probably means we won't get a time to have a little chat then with, uh, with Stuart Middleton in the 56 Janetta. But let me just move to the side and point out where it is. Because if you scan just down here, the orange and black Janetta, that's the pole sits on the left-hand side of GT4. Stuart Middleton in that car looking very, very rapid. So we're about to clear the grid. So up there to the commentators, starting with Andy McLuhan. Thank you, Britt. I mean, you can hear the noise. The, these things, we talk a lot about these cars and how spectacular they are to drive from Joe's perspective, the spectacular racing that they produce, but it really isn't until you get down there on the grid that you realize the size of the things and then the noise that they make. And it's one of the great things about GT racing. You can stand trackside, close your eyes, and you know which car has just driven past you. They all sound different uh, and they all uh, are uh, beautifully prepared and looking immaculate in the summer sunshine. Here we go, then the first 60 minute race of the day about to get underway. As we've been documenting, Two Seas Motorsport originally qualified on pole position in the hands of James Cottingham. It's Barwell though, Barwell Motorsport who get the pole position. Lamborghini always so strong here at Snetterton uh, and Joe Osborne, they've done it again. They land on pole position. What do you think their chances are of converting this into a race win? I feel better than Donington Park, purely on the stint length that Sean Balfe has got to do. We saw him so quick at the start of the stint and then the car faded away from him and then he just kept ebbing back into the pack. I think with the short first stint, Sean Balfe's got a mega, mega chance of leading it all the way to the pit stops. Well, the Lotus Amira safety car leads them around on their green flag lap in the following order. Sean Balfe on pole for Barwell Motorsport. Mark Radcliffe's number 27 optimum car starts second. Remember, he had a spin in morning warm-up earlier on. Darren Leung in the BMW is third. Matt Topham, his GT3 debut, and he's on the second row of the grid. Then it's Kevin Say. James Cottingham with the penalty can still do some damage there from sixth on the grid, ahead of Simon Orange and Richard Neary. The team have a racing Mercedes now, carrying the Evo kit for the first time. Mark Sansom in the second Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini he starts ninth ahead of Mike Price for Greystone GT. Good effort that for the Greystone driver. Ian Loggy though, struggled in traffic in qualifying. He is only 11th on the grid, the reigning champ, and man second in the points alongside Andrew Howard. That car will start towards the front, as both of them will in race two. Chris Hart and Lucky Kira are together then on row number seven. Row eight is shared uh, by John Ferguson in the Ram Racing Mercedes that he shares with Raffaele Marcello and Alex West in the Garage 59 McLaren. That will be at the front of the grid for race two later on. Mark Mark Smith for Paddock Motorsport 17th. That car was fastest in morning warm up today. Andre Borra did meanwhile starts 18th. And Ian Campbell, the last of the GT3 cars. Then we move into an always competitive GT4 field. It's Stuart Middleton who set the pole position time in his Raceway Motorsport Janetta, whilst Jack Brown for Optimum Motorsport will start alongside Ian Charles Clark, the championship leaders. Aston Miller and Josh Miller share row number two. DTO Motorsport McLaren ahead of the R Racing Aston. Then the Porsche of Zach Meekin. That car goes well over a long run. How will it fare in these short sprint races? He's got Michael Priest alongside. Priest, the highest place of the AM drivers in that first qualifying session yesterday first Pro-Am car on the grid. Harry George and Will Moore next in line. Will, the best of the Academy Ford Mustangs. Ian Goff, meanwhile, second in the championship. Struggled a bit in qualifying as an AM driver surrounded by Silvers and starts on that next row of the grid alongside Cavi Jundu. Then it's Eric Evans and Michael Johnston, Ford Mustang alongside BMW. The penultimate row of the grid uh, is going to be shared by James Townsend in the Toro Verde Ginetta and Carl Cabers in the Century BMW that has five extra seconds added onto its pit stop time. And at the back of the grid, Ian Duggan and Ed McDonald. Herbert, Ginetta and Mercedes rounding out the 36 car field. Well, this is going to be a fascinating race, that's for sure. 60 minutes, a narrow circuit, a real pinch point into that Wilson hairpin on the opening lap. No wonder Sandy Mitchell looks a little bit nervous watching on as his car in the hands of Sean Balfe will be lining up from pole position. On board camera here uh, with Darren Leung. He will start third in the Century BMW. And this car, after its win at Silverstone and a top five last time at Donington, sits third, in fact, joint second in the championship with Loggy and Gunon, who are, of course, 
well down the order. So of those cars at the top of the championship table, it's the BMW that is the best placed on the grid. We've also got an onboard here with Aston Miller in the DTO Motorsport McLaren from within the GT4 ranks. As two by two, they run out of Marie's in the summer sunshine. A big crowd on hand. Let's put on a show for them, shall we? And kickstart the second half of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. The red lights will go off momentarily and then we will be racing at Snetterton. Sean Bell from pole position gets us underway. Across the line they will go. He's got the inside line for turn one and already has cleared Mark Radcliffe who tries to come back at him. Can't get alongside. Up the inside there goes looking to third. Kevin Say on his toes too. Clean so far through Riches. Now down towards the braking zone at the Wilson hairpin though. And there's always someone who tries to throw a move up the inside. To the outside there goes Matt Topham. Bit of a slide in the Enduro Motorsport McLaren. But cleanly through the first couple of corners and for the first three or four grid positions still being held. All very civilised, all, almost Noah's Ark-esque, wasn't it? Two by two. Radcliffe almost looked like he conceded going for the lead against Balfour, tucked into second, which in hindsight was a smart move. Hanging on, you can see Cotting there on the front foot. We know he was the fastest in qualifying. Oh. A hit from Kevin Say on the back of top and that leaves the door open. Can Cotting fill that space and get past? I don't think there'll be much damage on either car. The worst off one, Cotting actually couldn't get the run on uh, Say there, could he? He had to slot back in. I don't think there'll be much damage there. Maybe on the diffusion of Topham in the Enduro car might just be losing one of the carbon fibre straights that hangs down between Smith on the inside and Ferguson West trying to get down the inside of Lucky Kira. It's all been super clean from that, apart from that little bit of contact as we go back on board of Dan Lewin. B3 here. No, second, isn't he? He's got past Radcliffe for the Optimum McLaren. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's all the way back there in front of Topham. Some drama's definitely happened there. Is there damage on that Optimum car? It's going slowly or he had an issue coming onto the back straight and that is why he's slow at the end of it. All looks okay on that far angle yeah, that view. Really what can we see? That's Nothing the there. The front end looks all right. There we see Mark Sanson running wide. Uh, looked like that was by himself. Didn't now look like Price got a move on him. Down the inside on Hart. That was a great move into the bomb. I don't see me a big slide from both of them focusing on the attack. This first lap has started oh. off today and uh, that sums up quite nicely. Hip and shoulder there on Mike Price. Should be able to rejoin as long as there's no steering damage on that front right. But he is going a long way, don't spin. Oh, too late. Round he goes. That was very rough stuff, wasn't it? All triggered by Ian Loggy actually getting up the inside of Mark Sanson. That created a real bottleneck. And, uh, well, unfortunately, it was Mike Price who came out of that the worst. It's Balfe with a one-second lead then at the end of lap number one. Second place, though. Darren Lee, one of the revelations of this year's championship, going after him in second place at a circuit in which the BMW wasn't really one of the fancied runners coming into this weekend. Third then for top of the best of the McLarens. Kevin Saber on board with him fourth. And James Cottingham gaining one place after the struggles for Mark Radcliffe who from the front row of the grid is down to seventh place. In GT4, it's still the Ginetta of Stuart Middleton out on top, so no change there. But a fascinating start to the race. You said it would be punchy, Joe, and you weren't wrong. Yeah, it was definitely a few punches thrown, wasn't it? Especially the Mercedes guys are all quite aggressive on each other. Although they're all the same brand of car, all run by different teams, apart from the two C's cars. They're the only sister Mercedes in the field. On board of Kevin Sacy, top and running a little bit wide, so we're going to get a better run out of Oggies potentially here. Kevin Say looks quick. Love that on board. We ran on board a lot with him in warm up, and he looked relaxed. First lap of the race, he's pretty tense in the arm. Team will be watching that, just telling him, Kevin, just chill. It's going to come to you. Looks like you've got the pace. Don't need to overdrive it here. But as you alluded to, Darren Lung's been a sensation, and he looks like he has got the pace on Sean Balfour at the moment. Took two tenths of a second out of him in the middle part of the lap as they come into this final sector. Gives a great shot of where everyone is. Mark Ratcliffe has settled back down in that position where he fell all the way down to P7. So he lost five places, probably just from one mistake. It'd be really interesting to see what that mistake was. Mark Sanson, one of the big losers of the opening lap. Ninth down to 12th. Ian Loggy, though, up two spots into ninth position. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, by the way, John Ferguson under investigation for that bit of contact that he had uh, with Mike Price. Purple middle sector for Darren Leung. You can see visibly that gap coming down. It was just a fraction over one second at the end of lap one. At the end of lap two, it comes down to eight tenths of a second. So the BMW is the fastest car on track right now and is getting away from this fight for third position, which stretches all the way back, really, to... Richard Neary in eighth, ninth there for Loggy, tenth for uh, Chris Hart, and then John Ferguson in 11th position, waiting now to see what's going on in GT4, where Stuart Middleton, well, he's converting that qualifying pace into really good early race pace. Look at the lead that he has now built up over Josh Miller in second, Aston Millar third, and Jack Brown down to fourth. So Brown losing a position or two, but there is simply no stopping Middleton. No, he's on a real good march. A little bit debut into turn one there. I saw uh, Borden flick it up, but uh, Middleton didn't go. We see the, the only fans in Juro GT4 looking at that Mustang. 
Academy really struggling with these Mustangs this weekend. Speaking with Matt Nickel Jones and Will Moore, there they just can't go any faster. The BOP has given every tool they've got. That car is almost at the end of its life. It's a really sad progression. You see every year the cars go quicker in qualifying. We're 1.1 seconds quicker than we were last year, and it's almost time for that car to move on into GT4 heaven. As we see Mike Price obviously gaining time. This is going to be a hard race for him now. Really, the only hope for himself and his teammate Colin McLeod is a safety car somewhere near the pit window, which punches them up and gives them a sort of second go at this race one today. At Porter points, at least once he's passed the GT4 cars, a safety car now wouldn't really help him because he's still mired in traffic and they don't have to jump out of his way, really, especially since he's technically uh, racing them for position. A bit of a Janetta battle going on here a bit further back. That's the number 80 car, which was um, in the hands of Ian Duggan, started at the back of the grid. He's picked a few places up, I think, uh, since then as the race leaders make their way out across the line. Gap perhaps creeping up again slightly on this lap. Topham looking a bit more secure in third position. And Kevin Say after that really, really good start. He was on his toes that first lap or so. Now slipping back into the clutches a little bit of James Cottingham, who I don't think was anticipating a great result from this race, but he's not doing a bad job so far. Up one place from where he started. If he can get past Kevin Say, find some clean air, could still salvage a top 10. Yeah, definitely. And I think you're looking at Kevin Say, it'd be interesting if we go on board as a four cars diving into turn one. Andrew Howard, one of them, actually spoke to Andrew yesterday and said his overtaking this year has just been next level. So I expect him to be confident with his overtakes. Mark Sansom in that Lamborghini, defending for Lucky Kira, Alex West behind. We know Alex West has had a few contacts already this year in previous races and has been penalised for it. So that will be in the back of his mind. But uh, yeah, back to Kevin Say, if we go on board, it'd be interesting to see on the dash what his tyre pressures are. The teams have to get the choice right on the pressures you go higher on the pressure more air in them then you've got a better chance of being quick at the start but the tire will go off and that's how it's looking at the moment but this battle is really raging when you consider then this isn't derogatory this is for 12th position it shows you how fierce the competition is as we go on board with mark sampson currently in 14th position andrew howard in front you can see that gap's edged up because actually sampson was looking to overtake howard into turn number two and that is just the nature of these cars. Their strengths and weaknesses really play out on the different nature of the corners that Snesson offers us here. Yeah, it sounds really slipping back here. He lost two places on that previous lap. Andrew Howard got through, so did Mark Smith in the paddock McLaren. That's the car now that Andrew Howard uh, has next on his list of cars to be overtaken. Not quite close enough down into Brundle and Nelson, but the Barba Lamborghini just seems to be down on straight line speed, doesn't it? The number 13 car right on his tail now. That's Lucky Kira. No pace at all for Samson here. No, and you can see, again, he looks stressed to me in his arms. I actually heard him hit the limiter as well on one of his gear shifts, and I think that's what gave Lucky Kira a bit of a run. And the problem is, you'll be looking looking in your mirrors, trying to plan what you should be doing on your defence, but that is all just taking away from the here and now of being fast. And you've got to stop the rut. He's got to get on the front foot. You ah. see the parking car pulled off to the side, looks on the exit of turn number four. Can't see any visible issue. It's a high traction zone there. So if there's going to be a problem with the drive shaft or any part of the drivetrain, that's normally where it is. For me, that's not in a safe enough position to leave there if he can't restart it. And there's no possibility of a live recovery in that position. So that is a, a big question for Peter Daly in race control. Is that going to be a safety car eight minutes into this race? I suspect it may be, and that's bad news for those who have compensation time to be added onto their pit stops. They wanted green flag running until that point uh, to try and help them disappear up the road. New fastest lap, by the way, for Simon Orange, 148.372, as he continues to reel in now, and has now reeled in uh, that third place battle. Here, Mark Sansom defending from Lucky Kera, dropping down into Agostini. This should be a yellow flag zone, though, uh, because of the Zach Meek in Porsche that's shown some good pace this weekend. A real shame that the uh, GT4 Porsche has found itself part of the side of the road because that's a car, oh, it gets going again. So that looked a bit like a control alt delete, that, Joe. Yeah, quite a long one. You, you have to power cycle the car, so turn it off and on. But unfortunately, the power cycle in some cars can be as long as 10 seconds with the switch off. You've got to let everything go to sleep and then start again. And maybe the first attempt, he rushed it and did eight seconds and then he's got to do it all over again. But that's great news for the, the clean racing nature of this. And uh, good job not to throw a panicky safety car and just give that sort of 90 seconds of time to get that car out okay. of the way. Oh, very hard there for Lucky Guerra down uh, into Brundle in the race lab McLaren. And Alex West gets 
little bit closer to him as a result. Uh, that lead gap, by the way, that was initially coming down between Balfe and Leung, it's now gone back up to 2.6 seconds. So there, Sean Balfe uh, is now starting to settle into his rhythm. The question is, is the gap second and third coming down? And the answer is yes, by seven tenths that time around. Matt Topham was faster than Darren Leung. So the BMW short run pace is good, but it does look like it's maybe working its tyres a little bit harder than the mid-engine cars. Not a huge surprise, I suppose, around a track like this as James Cottingham takes a very leisurely wide line into the Wilson hairpin and almost invited Simon Orange through into fifth place. Yeah, it was a bit of an open-ended invitation, wasn't it? You, do, you don't need to be giving anyone a sniff of a chance. Simon Orange was well within his right to have a look there as well. But uh, yeah, like you're saying on tyres, a couple of interesting things. That orange, literally orange McLaren with Simon Orange in it behind this Cottingham car, didn't do free practice one to save a set of new tyres. As we see that lucky Kira spun at turn number two. We know he was all over the back of Samson. We also know Alex West was behind him. Was it a spin because he was aggressive or was it a spin because he got tapped? No major damage I can see on that rear end there. Interesting to see. That Meekin back into the pit lane, so that car heads into the garage. They'll have to try and diagnose the problem and then get it fixed uh, before that second race later on. So the Porsche in the pit lane, uh, but with information of a different variety, I believe, down there is Bryn Lucas. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, as you can see, the, the car number 18, the Team Parker Racing Porsche, is in the garage. They had to do that recycle, as you're saying, the power recycle, but it's actually a gearbox issue, so they're now uh, trying to get to the bottom of it, but I'm not sure if we're going to see Zach back out on track a little bit later on. It might be game, set and match for them here at Snetton, at least for this race. That is a shame. Thanks, Brent, for the uh, update on Team Parker then. So to the end of another lap comes Sean Balf, and I think it is this fight per second that's starting now to develop nicely. I mean, what can we say here about Matt Topham, Joe? He is looking like he's been racing GT3 cars for years, but then he looked like he'd been racing GT4 cars for years when he jumped into the Aston Martin for the first time. That is one talented driver. Yeah, it really is. And super nice guy. And I, I actually met him years and years ago. He probably doesn't remember. I was working for Aston Martin at the time, and he just came in, and uh, he was obviously a lottery winner. So as we see an inside move on Orange, great move. So we saw him line up the lap before, but Cotton, surprisingly to me, didn't put any defense in, even though it had been shown the lap before and almost kind of conceded potentially, you know what, this isn't a championship battle with Simon Orange. I'm going to let him go. He's done the fastest lap of the race. I'm just going to tap onto him. One of these cars in front of Orange now, I can hear like a bit of bodywork rubbing on the floor. It's like a... T -t 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 -t. And I'm not sure which one it is. It'd be interested if we get a low shot. I think it's Topham's diffuser from that lap one contact. At the moment, it's okay, but I can definitely hear it bottoming out. The problem with that diffuser on the McLaren, where it meets in the middle of the floor, if it's the leading edge that goes and air gets underneath it, it's going to act like a parachute and eventually it's going to rip itself off. So I'm sure the Enduro guys there are looking at that. They probably can't hear it in the garage, but they need to get some tank tape on that to make it last the whole race for Marcus Clotten later on. Top two GT4 really stretching their legs as well now. Stuart Middleton and Josh Miller. Aston Miller are in third position, though, has the attentions of Jack Brown, championship leader in GT4. Jack Brown alongside Charles Clark, uh, and uh, what a decent lead it is as well. Some 24 points back to Ian Goff and Tom Wrigley. For Stuart Middleton, it's a perfect storm this weekend, a track that really does suit that uh, Ginetta. It's always suited Ginettas, whether it was the G50 uh, or the earlier iterations of the 56. And uh, we've seen it go very well in GT4 every time we get some of the more tight and technical circuits. So battles raging on in GT4. Uh, information on the timing screen as well that uh, the team manager of car 88 has been summoned to race control. This comes after an investigation uh, for an incident between uh, that car and car 13. So put the pieces of that one together. It does rather suggest that Lucky Kira's spin down at the Wilson Head was not self-inflicted. Yeah, and how early on it the car had spun for Lucky, it can only really be contact. So it'll be interesting to see how alongside, if at all, Alex West was and where the blame lands. But like I said earlier, Alex West has been a judge to be guilty of two incidences already this year. So he's going to probably uh, attract some kind of penalty maybe for his grid position for race two, like James Cottingham did. A great shot all the way down the back straight at Snetton. You can see the heat, can't you, coming out of the tarmac. The heat haze there as the two Ginettas rage on the background. Ian Duggan and James Townsend, they're actually teammates in the AM class sharing that car in front and now they're rivals they're, they are very good friends they tell me but I'm sure that will change if they hit each other in this race and Rose McLaren's really bunching up aren't they I feel sorry for Matt Topham with that damage the rear diffuser does a lot more than the big rear wing which looks like it does the show of the downforce but that diffuser is critical so he may even be getting a bit more drag and a, a little bit less high speed grip so it's 
wide on board and what we can see. We're not quite close enough to see it flapping, but uh, we see the, uh, the Paddock GT4 car facing the wrong way out. Corum, I think that is, into the last corner. Again, that could just be an innocent spin. It's such a difficult corner there to keep the car in control. Again, doesn't look like it's got any sort of damage. Can say actually coming into the clutches of Orange, isn't he? We know Orange really isn't in the championship battle due to other commitments. List missed the last round at Donington, so uh, he's able to be punchy, and all the other drivers do know that fact as well. And he has set another new fastest lap now as well, a 148.19. So as soon as he got past Cottingham, was immediately putting purple sectors in again, and now needs to try and do the same sort of thing to. Uh, Kevin Say, nearly 15 minutes into this race. The pit window for the GT3s opens 22 minutes into the race. For GT4, 28 minutes into the race. It's a 10-minute window for both classes. Simon Orange late on the brakes from a long way back. Gets to the inside of Kevin Say, who sensibly sidesteps out of the way. And Simon Orange goes through. Kevin Say, the quick hands there. We saw it from the picture-in-picture. Uh, required to avoid the contact. He saw Simon Orange coming at the very last moment. Yeah, great driving by both. Aggressive but fair by Orange. And turn two is the best dive bomb, as it were. So the dive bomb sounds a bit derogatory. It feels like you're the guy that's going to make the contact. But it's got to be done here at Sneddon. As long as it's positive and as long as it's obvious, at least Kevin Say was asked the question. And he, he had the answer of, you can turn in and there's going to be contact, or you can give me a car width and we can carry on our way. So mega job by Orange. We've also seen Orange's teammate Mike O'Brien being super fast at times as well. So really, really interesting to see where that car goes. Just getting notification on the timing screen. The sister car of this 93 Sky Tempesta, Alex West, has been given a 10 second stop and go penalty with adding in the pit stop, uh, pit lane length, sorry, it will be more like 30 seconds. So that really takes them out of the equation. And when you consider his teammate was on pole position, that car would have been strong in the second half of the race. Yeah, that is the saving grace, I suppose. They at least have that pole position to look forward to in race two later on, as Kevin Say dips a wheel on the grass there, coming out of Nelson, nearly loses control completely. Now, Simon Orange for the podium here is the next thing we need to watch for because he's relentlessly charging through the order. And here, as Matt Topham gets a bit delayed by Kavi Jundu, he's going to go straight on. Surely Simon Orange will get the better exit. Topham on the grass. And that was a really unfortunate moment. Matt Topham squeezed offline. Couldn't get the car stopped. They're four abreast across the line now because James Cottingham buys back into this as well. Kevin Say draws up almost alongside Topham and then eventually ducks back in line behind. For some reason, Say at the end of the straight seemed to lose performance. Matt Topham then off the podium. You can see that rear diffuser flapping around as Joe has been describing. That, though, I don't think was the course of that moment just got forced offline really into Murray's and straight on onto the grass he went. Now that is the 27 car of Mark Radcliffe looking up the inside. It's all bursting into life and this happens so often here Joe. You get those pinch points, those sort of moments where everything just sparks into life and you've got to pounce at that chance. Definitely and if you like that we're about to get a lot more of it. Sean Balfe race leader is about to catch the last of the GT4s. Obviously, Kavi Jundu, you can see in the background there. As we see Rackham to the inside, that is a big ask. James Cotton saw it coming, unwound the lock, like we saw with Kevin Say, and just gets the, uh, the exit. Really smart driving from Cotton there, but now he will be a little bit worried that Radcliffe looks racy. I'm sure he's angry after losing his second position on that first lap. I feel for Matt Topham, you saw how dirty the track was as he was braking, trying to get past that GT4 into the last corner. That will be his first ever GT3, GT4 overtake when he's been in the GT3. And those closing speeds are hard to judge. He just broke too late, compromised his own exit, ran wide and gave that position to Simon Orange. The only positive is I do think Simon Orange was going to overtake him on pace anyway, so it wasn't a disaster. So those Enduro guys there shouldn't be too worried about the second half of their race. But it's amazing that Cottingham should have been on pole, probably should have driven away from the field, had a really boring stint. But now he's in this battle pack. He just can't get past them, can he? We saw he just can't get the run on these cars to then ask the move. He's the one that's being overtaken when he should really be the overtaker. There were a couple of moments in the early laps where I think he had half a chance to gain some ground, but it seemed to me he was reluctant to really commit to it, guarding that championship lead as he is. He cannot afford a little bit of contact that could have disastrous effects on his championship hopes. Down towards Riches comes Matt Topham. We saw, though, looming on the horizon, that pack of GT4 cars that Joe just mentioned. So stand well back, everyone, because this could all be about to kick off now. The GT3 cars very tightly bunched, and they're about to come up across the GT4 cars, who themselves, of course, are having their own battles. And Topham 
uh, will just need to be grateful, I think, to see the pit window open here. He's starting to feel the pressure from Kevin Say as they drop out of Palmer's down towards Agostini. The two McLarens, of course, both generating their lap times in similar ways, being the same car, but that bit of damage on the back of Topham's car. Where could that uh, play into the favour of the man with whom we now ride on board? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I'm literally just text the number one mechanic of Enduro saying you've got diffuser damage, have some tank tape ready, and let's hope they can get there. As you see the stop pan, stop and go penalty for Alex West, 10 seconds feels like a long, long time. Pele Marshalls, Jules and Rachel there with the coach 59 guys doing it. On board of Kevin Say, really working the car hard, aren't we? You see all of these bumps at Sneston now starting to form, get bigger and bigger. The bumps always come in the brake zone and the traction zone. These cars are so much grip, they're basically rolling the tarmac up in those zones. Like when you run into the bathroom, the You've left the bath running, you slip on the bathroom mat. It's that feeling of the tarmac rolling up as they get past Egg McDermott in that first GT4. So now it's going to get interesting, especially when you're the first car in a GT3 group. You're the guy that's got to unlock the door for everyone else. All these guys following know the door's going to be open. They can put the keys in the pocket. They don't need to worry about any of that. They can pounce, and it is going to be interesting, especially when Matt Topham has already had an issue. Everyone's seen that, so they know he's already going to be second-guessing his own sort of plan and strategy on GT4 overtakes. Simon Orange is already on the tail of Darren Leung for second place here, so the McLaren man is a man on fire right now. They both go to the outside of the Toro Verde, Janetta uh, into Rich's corner, but at the first opportunity, I think Orange is going to have a go. Maybe that attack could come uh, into the Wilson hairpin. What about Kevin Say? Is he close enough to do the same to Matt Topham? No, he's not. Orange did peek to the inside of Leung, but Darren had that one covered. There's a sense of inevitability about this, though, and if Simon Orange gets a real wriggle on, he could then start eating into the 5.8 second advantage held by Sean Bell, because on the previous lap, he was quicker than the race leader, Simon Orange, by eight tenths of a second. No, yeah, mental. The, the pace is only getting better as well, isn't it? Proportionally to everyone else. So everyone's going to be looking at this battle again. Darren Lorang has got to look at how he overtakes these GT4 cars. He's going to catch three before the back straight. Maybe that McLaren on the back straight. It's going to be a hard overtake there. The Enduro car well within its right to hang it out. And that's going to give Simon Orange the run on him. He now gets down the inside. Simon Orange really sort of prowling, isn't he? He's not actually asking the question too aggressively yet, but I think that's because he knows he's got so much pace, he doesn't need to be that aggressive on that BMW in front of him. And a little peek to the inside of Williams there. That might just scupper his exit speed, but McLaren performing well in the speed traps. He's got a slipstream as well, and we know that car is good on the brakes. Simon Orange has proven that already. Uh, either side, meanwhile, we go over GT4 car. This is Kevin Save briefly up alongside my top, but again at the end of the straight, Kevin just seems to back off, doesn't he? Didn't want to risk going around the uh, outside there through Brundle and Nelson, and so the positions stay as they were. Up towards the bomb hole, James Cottingham now nips up the inside of the Enduro Motorsport uh, GT4 car. As up the road, Simon Horridge continues to nibble away at the rear of the uh, BMW in second. There is your race leader though, Sean Balfe. Don't for a second think that he's having an easy time of it in traffic either. It is a real dogfight out there. Yeah, it really is, and the GT4 cars have got so much quicker than this last year. They're actually harder to overtake as we see the first cars taking the pit stops. They're the first ones that can make it in. The guys in front couldn't stop because the pit window wasn't open for them. Simon Orange looking to the inside. He's actually looking a bit frantic now. He just needs to chill. He's going to be boxing this lap. So unless Darren Luring is holding you up more than you're going to gain getting past, he would actually be better, I think, to stay behind and fight it in the pit lane that way and see if Mikey O'Brien has the, the pace over Dan Harper, who's going to take over that BMW from Darren Luring. Yeah, none of these leading cars have any compensation time to be added on, so they will just be straight up pit stops, 75 seconds from pit in to pit out for the GT3 cars, 105 for the GT4s, plus extra time for the Silvers. Pit lane, a busy, busy place, as we expect here at Snetterton. It's a narrow pit lane. Tyres being changed there on the Sky Tempesta car, on the two season number one car as well. Uh, even after a relatively short stint, that uh, fresher rubber is going to be a real benefit for the pros, who uh, amongst them, Chris Froggart, strap themselves in and get ready to go and do battle. Yeah, and we see Kevin Say walking away there. They have to start the car up. We've got four mechanics can touch the car. They've, I think they've just got three there. Sky Tempesta, obviously strong boys in the gym. Push back and go. Is he going to get blocked in by the Optimum car? No, really good work by both of those cars. 40 kilometers an hour might feel slow, but when it's that tight in the pit lane, what's going to happen? Has Sean Balfe had a clear lap of GT4s? It looks like it's been quite clear up to this point. So his in-lap has been quite quick. That's the problem. When you can't all box on the same lap, you have this disparity of in-lap times created by the GT4 traffic. So I expect him to dive into the pit lane after the next left-hander, he goes in. If he stayed another lap, he would have had to overtake three GT4 cars, probably lose a second and a half, two seconds. See him dive in. You can attack the line all the way, keep going the line 
mean is way past where we are now. A little bit early for me. I could see his hazard lights on and the car had already stopped braking. Look at this chain of GT3 cars all dive in. Darren Luang, Simon Orange, then Matt Topham. He really attacked the line. He really closed that gap up. You can see the rear of the car sliding in. I think Matt Topham's my hero of the pit entry so far today. There's not a lot he can't do, is there, Matt Topham? OK, he's been fighting that damage, lost a couple of positions, but uh, not really many mistakes there. Sticker tyres going onto the Barwell Lamborghini. Century bring their car in as well. And now it's time for Dan Harper to get on board and go on the attack. So new front tyres then fitted to the race leading car that Sean Balfe will now hand over to Sandy Mitchell, former winner here at Snetterton himself, Darren Leung getting out and helping with the uh, driver change for Dan Harper as well. Still some sense of urgency here, those 75 seconds go by very, very quickly and as tightly bunched as the pack is here this weekend, you can't afford to drop even a second in the pit lane. Yeah, we see Sandy Mitchell with those sticker tyres, you said, I thought Orange was going to hand over drive Byron with new tyres but that car stayed on the floor so I don't think it will. Oh. Sandy Mitchell, that new tyre advantage as he leaves the pit lane is huge. That should, over the first four laps, probably give him up to six or seven seconds over a non-new set of tyres. So he's leaving the pit lane as we look at Critch Foggett coming around the last corner. I expect him to be five to six seconds clear of these two cars as he leaves the pit lane. Still got a good gap to Dan Harper now in that BMW and race on pit exit. So, <laughs> Dan Harper going very slowly at the end of the pit lane. You have this minimum pit time that you can't go over. All of these top teams use a GPS timer, which is telling the driver leaving the pit lane when they're clear to go. That time would not be clear, I don't think, for Dan Harper. And that's why he was so slow. And these two McLarens behind were asking him the question, why are you going so slow? But Harper's lost track position, so he must have been over the 75 seconds, had no uh, compensation time to be added on. And you can see here that he's dropped out, oh, behind, that's a floppy marker going flying. Thought a bit of bodywork had come off the 27 car there. But he's behind the 27, he's behind the Sky Tempesta car now, Dan Harper as well. So lots of time lost there, that, that was a bit strange. Yeah, but that's the extra lap Darren Lewing had to do because the pit window wasn't open for the AMs, but all the cars in front have had their pro in for an extra lap. So it was a Rob Bell out lap versus a Darren Lewing in lap. And that realistically could be two and a half to even three seconds. So even if their pit stop was right, there's three seconds that have evaporated. OK, then, right, all busy in the pit lane before the GT4 start to descend upon the pits. Let's head down to Bryn Lucas. Yeah, thanks, Andy. I'm here with Matt Topham, who knows exactly what it's like racing in GT4 here in British GT. But now you've tasted GT3 action and the closing pace you have when you come up against the GT4 cars. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy uh, seeing them guys out there. You know, or I know at least what they're dealing with and they're seeing me coming. But it's really hard to judge that braking distance and to make it clear to them where you want to be. Um, yeah, we got a little bit confused around Corum, but I sorted that out towards the end of the stint. So. Talk us through, and um, for the viewers at home that are watching this, what it's like stepping in from a GT4 to a GT3, because we know they look a bit different. They're a bit wider and a bit more aggressive looking, but there's a lot more to it than just that. Yeah, I think the GT4, you, you can be really gentle with it, roll the speeds in. It's all about keeping the speed up with this. It's really about braking power, get it slow, get it going, turn, go, go, go. And it's just a completely different driving style, which I've had to learn over the last few days. But thanks to Enduro for delivering an amazing car. And, you know, without the data engineer, I'd never ever progressed as much as I have. So it's a great feeling. You're like a duck towards the bottom. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Bryn. So, pit stop done for the GT3s then. The order, Sandy Mitchell leads uh, five and a half seconds back then to Chris Froggart, who myself and Joe were just discussing. This is about the best we've seen of Chris Froggart so far this season. It'll be interesting to see how his pace compares. Then, third position is where we find the number 27 McLaren. So that's really good stuff for Rob Bell. Fourth, Dan Harper in the Beamer. Fifth, Marcus Clutton uh, in the Enduro McLaren. And sixth place for Michael O'Brien. Plowman seventh, Sam Neary eighth, Johnny Adam ninth, and Ross Gunn in tenth position. So out of the top ten, Jules Gounon and Raphael Margello, 11th and 12th respectively, with some work to be done. The uh, pit stop for cars 77 and 67 under investigation. That's Enduro in the 77 car. Michael O'Brien's number 67. Not a huge surprise there. We saw their slightly dodgy pit exit. In GT4, though, it's a very serene Sunday morning drive so far for Stuart Middleton. He's making this look very, very easy, Joe. Well, yeah, he really is, isn't he? Their pit window opens this lap, so they can all box from here, but it's 10 minutes. So if I was Middleton, I'd be asking the team, what traffic have I got coming up against me? It only looks like Mike Price is going to be the one overtaking him, probably in the next two to three laps. I would keep that car out probably towards the end of the 
that window. And that's no disrespect to Middleton's teammate Tomlinson. That's just purely you want to use the free space. Here we are on board with Frogger all the way up in second position. Really is, he's going to be feeling a lot of pressure. The team will be telling him, just do your thing. Yes, you've got factory driver Rob Bell behind you, looming down in the optimum McLaren. But it's hard to overtake here, so you don't need to worry too much. So a big lockup when we rang on board with Dan Harper into turn three. The rear of that BMW looking extremely lively. Interesting to see what the race control guys would do about the pit window there. For me, it looked like Harper was going really slow. All of these cars have GPS speed sensors that race control can see live. They'll be able to replay that on the GPS monitor and see what speed Harper was doing. And for me, if it was anything below 30, 10 kph below the limit, it's him who should get the penalty. Yes, the McLarens are side by side, but I think that was almost like, do we need to go around this BMW? Has he got a problem? Um, so yeah, interesting. We've got it all to play out with the GT4s and their pit stops <laughs> in the next 10 minutes, basically. Uh, some GT4s in already, actually. I can see there the Toro Verde, Ginetta amongst others, but as you quite rightly predicted, race leader Stuart Middleton in no rush to pit. We do have, though, Josh Miller and Aston Millar in. Uh, so that means that you, we have uh, Jack Brown up into second place. Not the same rush to get the GT4 cars in general, because the silver class cars, uh, well, the two drivers should be, in theory, fairly even on pace. It's the Pro-Ams who you'd expect to be coming in, although Michael Kreese can't be dragged in. Uh, he stays out, actually, as the highest place of the Am drivers to move up into third place in the class. There is the R Racing squad going to work. They've had a good day already in Ginetta Junior Racing with two wins from two uh, for Freddie Slater, who I reckon we'll be seeing racing in British GT in the not-too-distant future. But this Aston Martin has looked strong so far this weekend and they will have a good chance of a good result. So uh, as far as the compensation time is concerned in GT4, by the way, 10 extra seconds for race labs. That's the car uh, that Ian Goff uh, will, uh, has just been uh, getting out of. Seven extra seconds for Jack Brown, who is second place in the class at the moment. And then the five extra seconds for Carl Cavers, who already has been in to make his pit stop. So that will have a bit more of an effect to the front runners. A couple of the front runners in this race do have that extra time to serve. And also then throw in the extra 14 seconds for the silver cars. And that really could jumble the order up. Yeah, really, really uh, good. And it's interesting to see where it goes. He's just in such a nice bit of space, Middleton. You want to stay out there forever, basically, and uh, see what goes on. The only concern would be if there was a safety car that plays into the hands more of the guys who are already stopped. You don't go a lap down here with the pit stop. So, yeah, those guys will have that in the back of their mind. But it's probably worth rolling the dice. You saw the interesting bit, the Aston Martin GT4 pit stop. The two drivers having different seat inserts, so it adds a little bit of complexity. But when you've got two different size drivers, it's the only way to make them both comfortable. Is he going to stay out? Looks like he is from the body language of the car. Looks like Ewan Hankey now taking over from Lucky Care is going to get past in the straight line. No time loss for either of them. So off they go again. He's got another six minutes remaining. He needs to be in by the end of that, not out. So it's not so stressful to worry about. So potentially got three more flying laps to do before he has to box. Indeed so. So he makes his way through the uh, Wilson hairpin. Interestingly, did just put a lap on the uh, cars that have uh, pitted some of those silver cars with the extra tide to be added on. They are just about losing a lap uh, here today. So Stuart Middleton continues on his way. Now this then, the battle going on for, well, I was going to say second, but actually uh, Chris Frogger with a few car lengths advantage now over Rob Bell, who has got Dan Harper right on his tail. Harper won't be very happy uh, having lost a couple of positions after the pit stop. We know that this car has the potential to finish on the podium. He's got to find a way past one of the most experienced drivers on the grid first. Yeah, it looks hard work, that optimum car. When we followed it around Corum, you want to really hold the white line all the way in on the inside. It just didn't look like Rob was able to hold it. Look at the power of this BMW. Rob's going to have to hold the pit wall on the right, try and send him round the outside. It's going to be a hard move round the outside, but it will narrow Rob Bell's entry into turn one. And Dan probably looking for the cutback here. Two apexes. Is he going to be able to get the inside into turn two? Rob needs to close the door, but Dan Harper just had the overlap, didn't he? Late on the brakes, Rob Bell's done a mega job to get there, and he has cut the nose off that BMW. That was Russian roulette. He had a gun to his head there, Rob Bell. He had to turn in to stop the move, but if he'd created the contact and spun himself, that would have been all on him. Look at that BMW turn three. It looks atrocious. Look how much space he's lost. That is the nature of these cars. At high speed, this BMW looks like the best car out there. Then in that medium, low speed, it just hasn't got the agility of that McLaren in front, and that's why we're seeing such a big ebb and flow. But look at Chris Froggett. He's gone away. He'll be the happiest man with this battle. But you know, for me, Rob was really struggling around that high-speed corner, and the positive of holding the inside is you create more dirty air on the racing line for Dan Harper. Dan was able to just have the clean air and the racing line, so Rob will definitely be making a note of that. He needs to go in a little slower and it will compromise that BMW 
more than what he did on the previous lap. This is the fascination though of GT racing is that these two cars designed completely differently, built completely differently, generating their lap times completely differently, and yet nose to tail in a battle for a podium position. And the BMW may well be good down the straights, but through that technical middle sector seems to be struggling a little bit. Uh, drive through penalty, by the way, has been handed out to car 67. So Michael O'Brien for an unsafe release being penalized. So that's the decision that the uh, stewards have made and he will have to come in from sixth position which is a real shame that car on the tail of Marcus Clutton who doesn't seem to have the pace to go with the leading group ahead so he perhaps is suffering a bit more now from that damaged uh, rear diffuser than we saw from Matt Topham again kind of makes sense the pros will maximize the potential of a car won't they so any damage they're going to feel it maybe more than the amps yeah definitely that drive through is going to really hurt probably going to drop Mike O'Brien all the way down to 12th or 13th position so Real shame for those two. We see a driver change going on now with one of the gestures. They were doing a, a tire change as well, but five wheel nuts to do on the GT4 cars versus the single big nut on the GT3 cars. We see a bit of a battle pack form in there. Got Adam, Gunn, Gunnar, Marciello, all there. That is an interesting battle that's going to start to rage but it's all the way down in P9. How much are they going to battle? Johnny Adam probably just wants points from this race. His teammate, James Cottingham, not looking best pleased. It was a hard stint for him, especially when, in his mind, he should have started on pole. So they just need a clean race. Can they catch maybe the Abacar in front? That's probably their best realistic uh, chance of more points. Uh, indeed so. You score points down to 10th position in British GT. So at the moment, Jules Goon on in 10th, scoring one point, whereas uh, Raffaele Marcello, 11th, is scoring nothing. But Johnny Adam is in the points uh, for eight positions he will take home four championship points from this race and that is not to be sniffed at we've seen these championships year on year decided by two or three points at the end of the season you've got to fight for every single position and Johnny Adam is well aware of that he's leading this very rapid queue of GT3 cars and they are gaining slightly uh, on Sam Neary uh, actually no they're not Sam Neary was two tenths quicker than them on the previous lap as he starts now uh, to make his escape. Although on this lap, I reckon Johnny Adam may be bringing the gap down ever so slightly. Team manager of car 36 now being summoned to uh, race control. That's DTO Motorsport. Now that is of significance. One of the front running cars in GT4. Josh Rolich is on board that car now after it's pit stop. And they have done something that they have to assume maybe another pit stop infringement as in comes the Jack Brown car to hand over to Charles Clark uh, for the second half to sit the car that had uh, inherited second place within GT4. Still, though, Stuart Middleton continues to pound around and uh, not really wait. He's going to wait right to the end of the pit window, isn't he? Yeah, and we've seen a, a change of position here. Rob Bell now behind Dan Harper. Wonder where that move was done. It was obviously done on the on the last lap. Just looking at the sector times, looks like it was probably done in the middle sector. There was a three tenths difference in that sector. There was only one tenth between them at the start of the lap. More GT4 cars to get around. That's going to really hurt Rob Bell, I think. Here, Harper's going to get that first one in here. Rob Bell's going to have to sit behind that one, and then Harper's going to be clear. So I think that gap's probably going to grow. Can Rob Bell get past that R2? Tora, GT4, McLaren, no, he can't. That gap will go again. Harper's the man on the move. Can he catch Chris Fogg? It's going to be really interesting to see how that goes. 23 minutes remaining. The first 37 have evaporated past us, haven't they? On board with Dan Harper. Let's see where that Chris Fogg car looks strong. So expect the BMW to start gaining from any point now on the straight. He's flashing his headlights to warn this Mustang in front. I'm coming past Blue flashing light on the right hand side it's going to be a bit of a lunch from there Middleton finally boxes gets it slowed down he's going to be handed over to Tomlinson with a really nice healthy lead isn't he it's going to be a good race I think for Tomlinson just needs to stay out of trouble and bring that car home had to pit this time because there were only 40 seconds before the pit window closed but as Joe said as long as you're in the pit lane when that happens uh, then that is absolutely fine so in comes the Ginetta uh, Raceway Motorsport will go to work there is Freddie Tomlinson's second season now of British GT racing for Freddie and uh, he will get into the car and head back out on his way no compensation time to be added for this car it does have 14 extra seconds uh, to be served being a silver car and again tyres change there on the front of the Ginetta I kind of understand uh, why, in fact, it's the left-hand side they're changing, isn't it, on the Ginetta. I kind of understand why some GT4 teams might choose not to change tyres. We'll get to that in a moment, because already Chris Froggen has been overtaken by Dan Harper. Dan Harper into second position. As soon as he catches them, he seems to be able to find a way through. He's ten and a half seconds off the race leader, but clearly now at one with the car. Yeah, really. And here we go into turn number one. Just gets a big run 
got strong enough defence from Frogger there. He felt like he was probably covering it, but when the pit wall then stops, there's suddenly another car width of track on the pit exit. The uh, raceway guys giving Middleton a big hug and Tomlinson takes off, so they're obviously happy with their pit stop going on board. Now with Tomlin, uh, sorry, Thomas Tomlinson in the sister car, uh, I think it might actually be Tomlinson, the 55 car is, uh, is Tomlinson. So uh, coming in, just needs to get this out lap out of the way. It's hard to get up to speed. No, sorry, it was uh, the right one there. So just needs to get back into it. Middleton was celebrating his pit stop early. I'd, <laughs> I'd rather do that once the car had gone. That's what... Uh, threw me off there, just looking at the stopwatch, the car controllers, counting those mechanics in the white helmets down. Be a nice leisurely pushback and then just release. So this is going to be interesting what's going to happen between these two cars, how close they're going to be. They're at the end of the pit lane, so Holland's going to be close, but that car should be pushing back any second now, and it's going to be a race between them, isn't it? Obviously, the reason they've got close is this car doesn't have the silver-silver penalty time. It's going to be really close into turn number one. It is, isn't it? Because the 56 car's got to get up to speed. This is going to be almost nose to tail by the time they get down to Wilson. And of course, now Thomas Holland, who is a pro, uh, going up against Freddy Tomlinson, a silver graded driver, should have the advantage. He's got the warmer tyres. He's had a lap or so to get himself up to speed. They negotiate the 24 McLaren there into the Wilson hairpin. And it's nose to tail all of a sudden in a raceway motorsport 1 2 in GT4. How long then do we think before Freddy Tomlinson starts to settle down? He's already starting to gap Thomas Holland, who in fairness, had to get out of the way there of the uh, GT3 McLaren. Yeah, he saw him move off the racing line to give the GT3 car of Ollie Webb the racing line to try and lose less time, but I just don't think Webb read that and they actually compromised Holland quite a lot there, didn't they? We're seeing this gap now has really grown. There shouldn't be any team orders here, even though Tomlinson is the son of owner of Ginetta. I think these guys will be free to race. They're both at the front end, so the only thing they would have been told is no damage whatsoever should be inflicted on each other. But uh, over the next few laps, we'll really see where these cars pan out pace-wise. We know Tomlinson's been really fast, so yes, Holland's the pro, but Tomlinson can really hold his own on this field. So interesting now, they've got a, a bit of time, probably have to adjust that mirror because it just dropped down and gets a bit of a wobble on as, as the speed builds at the end of the straight. They've probably only got this lap and a little bit more the next lap before they get GT3 traffic in thick and fast. Uh, one second stop go penalty for car number 42. That will be for a pit stop that was one second too short. James Kell then will leave the track from 12th position to go and serve that. Whilst here, Sandy Mitchell looks strong out in front. He is, though, a fair chunk slower than Dan Harper on this lap. We've seen he's had some traffic to deal with and now has the Ollie Webb GT3 McLaren to try and negotiate too. Uh, but uh, we'll watch to see whether that's a trend or whether it's just the traffic that has been holding him up. McLaren really getting away from the Lamborghini down the straight. Ollie Webb does pull out of the way, though. Good driving that from Ollie. He pulls clear of the racing line. And allows Sandy Mitchell to go through. So that was 148.2 for Mitchell. Dan Harper is not yet at the line, such is the margin for the Barwell Lamborghini. It's 11.3 seconds. It came down by half a tenth. Nothing too much to worry about. Whilst further back, the other Barwell car having a very different race, Joe. Yeah, it's always been in the thicket. Now with Will Tregertha taking over from Sansom. See Mike O'Brien now in this artificially low position after that drive-through penalty for an unsafe release, trying to work out where it's going to go. It's hard now for Mikey. You're not really battling for a big position, so there's no excuse to damage that car. And that's probably where his mindset is now, unfortunately, is just to bring that car home. Learn a little bit for race two. What do you want to change the balance setup-wise? But really, you're not fighting for points all the way down now, whereas he ended up 14th position, so even a little lower than I thought he would be after the drive-through. So, yeah, really tough afternoon uh, for that orange JMH car. Uh, no penalty for DTO, by the way, though no further action on the pit stop for car 36. That is good news. We'll give it a lap or so and see how uh, the rest of GT4 has started to settle down. But we know that it's Freddie Tomlinson leading from Thomas Holland. I think Seb Hopkins uh, in third position in the number 23 machine. As uh, here comes the 72 Lamborghini. Uh, Will Trigger, the 12th position. He sits to the outside, attempted to go Wallace there. Quite able to make the move stick. They got the inside of the 29 Lamborghini. That's really plummeted down the order now after serving that uh, compensation time in the pit. So Tom Wrigley in danger actually falling out of the points now within uh, GT4. Good news for the car. It's his second in the championship battle. Uh, more penalties now, by the way. Stop go penalty for Enduro Motorsports. So Marcus Cluck now being given a stop go penalty and Paddock Motorsport as well. Martin Plowman, a one-second stop-go penalty. So two cars from the top seven there, Joe, that are about to head back down to the pit lane. 
Yeah, uh, we saw it live. I, I can't work out if it's Mikey O'Brien or Clutton that was on like the inside of those gaggles of cars on pit exit. I assume it was Clutton who kind of left the fast lane to look to try and get round those slower cars held up by by Harper, but uh, race control, I assume, aren't happy with that, and that's the penalty. The one second, like you said earlier, that'll be for under the pit stop time. But uh, yeah, really, really difficult. You saw both of these boys here pushing hard, and it's such a pet hate of mine flashing, even though my criminal record would say otherwise, but it's got to be more productive. Flashing your headlights makes no difference. When I was in GT3, I'd go around every GT4 driver at the start of the season, just say, hi, I'm Joe, I'm probably gonna hit you at some point. This is my car. And just so you know, when I'm overtaken, if I'm flashing my headlights, it means I'm overtaking. It means I've committed to the move. I'm not going to flash you from 40 metres behind to try and tell you get out of my way because I know you're not going to. The flash should be used as a warning, not as an, an intimidation tool. And these kids don't seem to get that. It does really seem to wind me up, doesn't it? I'll stop now. But uh, yeah, looks like Barwell got this car quicker for Balf and Mitchell. But Sansom and Tregertha, yes, they're in the silver amp class rather than the pro amp, but they just don't seem to have the same pace. And although sister cars can have all the data and all the video, if the driver wants something different, they sometimes do start to split on their setup, which seems strange. You would have thought they copy each other and just create the fastest car, but that doesn't always create the fastest driver for that car. So it's always a, an interesting dynamic, an inter-team battle, as it were. Uh, DriveTac, who you're seeing on your screen now, are running in 13th place. However, they are being given, as you can also see, a drive-through penalty for track limits. First one of the day, and uh, possibly not the last either, with the new Motorsport UK track limits regulations coming into full effect these days. And uh, that is going to be the next car to head down to the pit lane. Team manager of cars 17 and 86 to race control. Uh, tell you what, uh, there's going to be a sizable queue outside the clock of the course's office by the end of this race. Lots of teams getting themselves into some hot water for various reasons. And we still have nearly a quarter of the race to go. 14 and a half minutes remain. Clutton and Ploughman bail for the pit lane. And all of this playing back into the hands of Johnny Adam, who, let's face it, knows how to win a British GT Championship. That car is back into sixth place now, which is where it was running more or less at the start of the race. Yeah, and when you consider they had a 10-second compensation time, they would have bitten your hand off for it. And that is what wins you championships. And it doesn't matter what car he's in, what teammate he's got, Johnny Adam always does it. Yes, this result has been luck, but you make your own luck. You're in front of that next pack behind you. If you're behind Gunn, Gunnar, Marcello, then you wouldn't be inheriting such a big points jump as we look at uh, Tomlinson there in the leading GT4. And he really has pulled away, hasn't he? 3.3 seconds now to the sister car of the Genetta. Can't even catch it in shot in between turns four and five. But uh, yeah, Johnny Adams in a nice position here. His pace is strong. He's a little bit faster than um, Neary in front. But in sixth position, is it going to be worth a risk to try and overtake? Probably not. He would already be thinking, you know what, I'm happy where I am. No mistakes, and I'm going to bring this back to the end. I, I think these guys won't have to negotiate any more GT4s before the end of the race. 13 minutes remaining, probably going to do five more flyers, maybe one or two, but really not much. So it's going to be nice and relaxed end to the finish. Anyone else on the move? Really, Dan Harper's been the fastest guy out there, which is, is no surprise. We know he knows how to hustle but he's only catching half a 10 for a 10, but it's still at 11 seconds to Sandy Mitchell. The interesting bit with Mitchell, I would say, is that they did put new tires on in the stop, and I feel that was a bit too conservative. They already had a six second lead when Balf pitted, didn't have any compensation time. I would have set, saved, sorry, that set of tires for race two, where they're gonna be more in the mid pack, given Balf them when he got in the car race two, but they obviously kind of feel this is our best chance for a good result today. Let's cement it, uh, but yeah. I think that is why they've got an 11 second gap, is that new tyre hit Sandy got to grow it from five to 11. I said it was worth six seconds. Five plus six, 11, I'm a genius. <laughs> you do know what you're talking about, I'll give you that, Joe. Thank you for ask, answering the question that I never got around to asking about 15, 20 minutes ago, because I was wondering why some teams have gone for new tyres, some had, of course, we know they're limited uh, on the amount of uh, new sets of tyres they're allowed over a weekend. You've got to pick and choose when you think it is uh, the best time to put those tyres on the car. On board now with uh, Rafa Marcello, then ninth position right now, closing in or trying to on Jules Gounon, but two more evenly matched drivers you're not likely to find uh, out on track right now. And so that gap staying fairly stable. Uh, they are 13 seconds then ahead of Will Tregertha, who just moved into the top 10 as a result of Marcus Clutton coming in to serve that penalty. So Marcus Clutton uh, and Michael O'Brien, in fact, both right on the tail of Tregertha in the fight 
for the final championship point. Personal best lap, by the way, for Rob Bell last time around, 146.9, a couple of attempts quicker than the leading two. Who, by the way, Sandy Mitchell and Dan Harbour just set a lap time that was only one thousandth of a second apart. So we see this all the time, don't we, Joe, that the pros are so, so evenly matched, but over a circuit of this length, it's even more impressive. It really is, and again, going back to Dan Harbour, to get past people, we know it's hard to overtake here, because he's fresh into British GT, always sort of rips up the rule book and goes, I don't care what you say, can't overtake, I'm going to do it. And it's great to see you gone board and march around Coram here, drifting a little bit wide. Car looks well balanced on the brakes, hold it over to the right, in, don't hit the sausage curb, and off we go again. You really hear this Mercedes bottom out as we rode earlier on in the lap through Hamilton. You can hear the right hand seal just kissing that. Like, and that's just the car leaning over. It gives quite a nice feeling to the driver, although it's bottoming out, it gives a nice stable platform. The opposite, when you see that GT4 Aston Martin leaning all the way over, look how softly sprung that is. Good at slow speed normally when the car is soft, but worse at high speed, not so stable for the driver. We're going to see three different cars battling here, I think, for the last 10 minutes of the race. Aston from BMW, from McLaren. Who's got the pace between them? The last few laps, it's been really tight between them. Be interesting to see in the last 10 minutes, do the cars change? Do the pressures of the tyres come up and transform it anymore? BMW looks great through turn one, doesn't it? Gets a run, shows you inside, makes the Aston Martin go to the middle, defend. So we'll be able to open this corner up. Bit of a cutback, but it's a bit of a pointless cutback here because the next corner is a left hander. That really is the problem with Snetton. It's always a right followed by a left. It's hard to get momentum. A GT3 car cutting through the Martin Plowman. Is that going to give an opportunity potential to Chris Selko and Callum McLeod now? in the GT3 car. That's sometimes what you're hoping for. A bit of an interesting move from the Aston Martin, actually actively defending against the GT3. Really, oh, and then McLaren McLeod then just cut the nose off the BMW. He had to really check up. Now that's given the advantage to Josh Rowledge and the DTO. Look at that gap. That's how traffic can transform for, for no real reason. That was just poor planning on quite a few of their parts, in my opinion, of how to get round the traffic. And just like that, time then lost by Josh Rowledge as well, as on the inside came the uh, Ewan Hankey McLaren. So it ebbs and it flows all the time, and it can often come down to just a bit of good or bad fortune, really, in the traffic, as to whether you win or lose from those situations. This for uh, third, fourth, and fifth then within GT4, making their way down towards Brundle and Nelson, and it's just sort of separated that battle pack for the time being, as Ewan Hankey's car starts undressing itself uh, at the end of the Bentley straight, bodywork flapping loose so on the right rear corner. Car, Josh Rowledge, who two or three corners ago, we said might be about to gain a place. All of a sudden, is under pressure from Lewis Plato in the BMW as Chris Salkel is having a few close encounters of the GT3 card at the moment. Yeah, really, really difficult lap for them. It's probably lost some two to three seconds on this lap. Just well, kicking up the dirt. Is Kel going to have a lunge on the Aston Martin to the last corner? No, he thinks better of it. So they all live to fight another day as they cross the line. Still got Marvin Kershoff in that golf livery. Garage 59 McLaren to come past as well. Raul is probably going to hold the inside left. Kershaw will come all the way round and then he'll pull over to the left now and take the racing line. But look at that gap all the way to the BMW. BMW in his rear view mirror filling that up. Got a great run. I didn't expect that. The BMW super fast at the end of the straight. Is he going to have to defend in turn number two? Yes, he is. BMW good on the brakes as well. But really he looks like that BMW starting to come alive a bit more in this second half of the, the championship, isn't it? Aston Martin giving the racing line to Kershoffer. They're all clear for a little bit longer until the drive tack Mercedes is going to be there. But that BMW really looks like it's on the move, doesn't it? It looks super aggressive. Lewis Plato, super fast, and anything he drives is really, really asking the question here at the DTM McLaren. Quite a lot of one mate racing in the past as Lewis, so he knows how to overtake cars that are near identical in performance, but now he does seem to have a couple of little strengths in that BMW over the McLaren, as we saw particularly at the end of the straight, Josh Rowell is trying to move across to defend from the drive type Mercedes. That was only ever going to end badly, and it might cost him the place because Lewis Plato gets a better exit out of Hamilton. Couldn't get alongside, though, into Oggies, and Rowledge gets away with it. I can see why he didn't want to let the Mercedes through on the inside line, uh, but that nearly ended in tears. And it goes back to your point, you know, you saying on the grid to James Cottingham, the onus really on the GT3 car to make the clean pass, but when the GT4 starts to defend from the GT3, that's when things can start getting a bit silly. That was also a very late move from Rowledge. These two, I think, both started to get a bit frustrated with each other. I'd say desperate. That was bizarre driving from Rowledge defending against the GT3 car. If I was that GT3 of Wallace next time, I'd hit him. That would really annoy me beyond belief. 
there's just no need for it. It just compromised both of them. It was a bizarre, it was almost like he thought it was a GT4 car, like it was Plato, maybe it caught his eye in the mirror. I'll try and give him an excuse, but bizarre driving would be the best positive I can give him as an adjective. Plato a little bit further behind. These GT4s don't suffer so much with the dirty air, just because they're less aero-dependent, as you see a big old slide hit the track limit sensor to measure as well. I'm also seeing the sister car now right back on the back of the 23R racing Aston Martin. A few warning flags going out, most probably for track limits. What they got round turn number one. I'm surprised how good the BMW looked previous lap there. You can just see gaining a little bit. The Aston's going to have to dive over to the right to block back to the left. I think what we need to be looking at now, to be honest, from Selkeld is this sort of fake look, thinking that that's what it's going to do every time. Next, go back to the left, like going for race down, and then double cut back, like we saw from the sister GT3 car. Dan Harper do so well at Silverstone. The Silverstone 500 to Brooklyn did the double dummy, and he got himself the race win, effectively off the back of that, in my opinion. So, it's all, all bunching back up again, though. This two-car two car battle is going to turn into a one-four-car battle, I think, quite I think, soon. I think you're right, because the more that we see Hopkins defend, the more he's delaying the pair of them. But look, one more defensive move, that move through uh, Agostini there does now allow uh, Rowledge and Plato to reel them both in. BMWs look really good mid-corner there, don't they? Through those medium and high-speed corners. It's uh, Chris Halkel just carrying that little bit more minimum corner speed and uh, really gets onto the tail of the Aston. Both front-engine cars, so in theory, will deliver their performance in similar ways, but uh, uh, clearly some small differences in that. Uh, we've had an instant, by the way, between R97, Ross Gunn, uh, and the number uh, 80 Toro Verde Ginetta being investigated. More news on that as and when we get it, as the GT4 battle makes its way down to Brundle and Nelson again. Rowledge ducking and diving, but this time has lost out uh, to Lewis Plato, who finally manages to find a way into the top five. I might yet might make more progress. Yeah, five minutes remaining again. Sister cars, probably no team orders between the BMWs, but it does look like Plato is probably the quickest out of these four cars, doesn't it? And is Selkow potentially going to say, you know what, come past me and you open the door on the Aston Martin. I'll be able to follow you through on Seb Hopkins. But uh, yeah, interesting to see going on board the McLaren really squirrely out the last corner. Maybe tyre pressure is just starting to come up. Super hot day here at Snetston. These guys were really, really working the tyres, getting to the end of their usable life after an hour. Let's see what Selkow's going to do into turn number two. So I expect it's a smaller gap than the lap before. The Aston's going to have to go even more aggressive to the right. So take him over, take him over, and then dive back to the left. But Plato's filled that space on the left. Is he going to be able to go all the way around the outside and his teammate? I think not. And is that going to give Rowlidge a chance in the DJ McLaren? A run on him. Plato defends a little bit. So hard when you're in the middle of a battle. You try and overtake and then suddenly you go from being the attacker to the one getting attacked. It's really difficult to manage that sort of situation. Fantastic racing. I really enjoyed this battle. And for now, Seb Hopkins hanging on to third. Salkeld again fakes to the inside. Then moves back to the racing line. In fact, misses the apex by a mile, though, does Salkel, and almost allowed Lewis Plato to uh, nip up the inside of him. Towards Hamilton that they go now, and uh, a tricky little left-hand kink uh, sort of separates the field a little bit, not then close enough to have a go with Salkeld into the uh, breaking zone at Oggies. Back straight, that surely is the part of the circuit where the BMWs can maybe gang up on the Aston Martin ahead. Salkel good off this corner. We know the Beamers are working well at the end of the straights. Is he going to be close enough though? That's the question on board with Josh Rowland. You can see the Beamers getting away and definitely starting to ask some questions now of Hopkins, who moved briefly to cover, then back to the racing line. Salkel again peeks to the inside, just can't quite commit under braking, can he? Now he's having almost a few too many half looks. He must save up his attack for one big go, and I still think. Turn two is his best opportunity for it, place the strengths of this BMW. Yes, in this McLaren, you see the cars pulling away, so you're like, of course, I've got in a slow car, but look how good it is in the medium speed sort of stuff, the McLaren. It's very much more aero-dependent car. They all need to do the same speed, so you can't be the best in the corner and the straight. And the McLaren at the moment, with where they are in the BOP window, they want to be fast in the straight. When we did development, that's where the engineers wanted to take it. The problem is you can't overtake in the corner, you overtake at the end of the straights. So that's why I think the DTO drivers will be frustrated with that. They've got good pace over a lap, but to overtake and defend is very, very difficult. And that's why you see the ebb and flow of that gap. I don't think Rowledge is doing a bad job. It's just no. a, it was contact there, wasn't it? Saw so Plato load up the rear to the inside. Is Rowledge going to get one, two? Definitely one. Plato on his outside, now passed. Plato just looked like he got caught up by the concertina effect, didn't he? You see him locking the rear. Then he hit his teammate slightly, put him out of sight, and then he lost the play. So 
one little mistake has lost him all that hard work he did to get past this McLaren we're on board with. Yeah, and that could have been an awful lot worse, though. Could have had both of the Beavers in the weeds with that. Now, look who's catching them. That is Sandy Mitchell, overall race leader. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, he is going to have to deal with some GT4 traffic, and it's probably the most intense battle on the track that he has to negotiate. Gets past Plato and Rowledge uh, before they get into Hamilton. But now he'll have to sit behind Chris Solkelt for a corner or so. Still got this 10.3 second lead, though, over Dan Harper in second place, who is 6.7 ahead of Rob Bell, who is 6.3 ahead of Chris Roggen, who is six seconds ahead of Sam Neary, who does then have Johnny Adam and Ross Gunn in close company. I'm not sure those two are going to want to take a massive risk here in the closing stages. Here's the replay of the contact. Joe, what do you think? Yeah, just a tiny little bit late on the brakes, uh, brakes by Plato and then only had uh, his teammate to hit to help slow down. Uh, Rowley's read it really well though and saw the gap opening up on the inside and just put the McLaren there, so uh, Plato couldn't come in for a late apex effectively, but uh, back past him, missed that, but back to where they were uh, less than half a lap ago, so probably the same move again at the end of that straight as we go back to the GT3 battle. That's Clutton from O'Brien. We saw them very close in the pit lane. They both had to do drive-through penalties, hence why they're both still very much together at the end of it. Before their drive-through penalties, they were two tenths apart, and they're now three tenths apart, so uh, very frustrating races, but very, very similar as we see Sam Neary now starting to hold up Johnny Adam and Ross Gunn potentially. It doesn't matter where Johnny Adam is in the field. There's always an Aston Martin. There's only one. It's like haunting, isn't it? I've said before, he's been with Aston Martin for so long and it is now just like an ex-girlfriend haunting him everywhere he goes. Ross Gunn probably wouldn't be his choice of partner, but uh, always very fair with each other so far. I do just wonder where Johnny Adam's head's at. He's still contracted by Aston Martin. How hard are you going to be on your employer's car if the question is asked? Your championship lead as we see a GT4 battle livening up there. That's going to really hold Sam Neary up. Johnny Adam will have his eyes wide open. Can he get a run potentially on Neary as he has to cut back to the inside? Not much momentum difference there. But interesting, Mike Simpson having to try and hold his own there, but forced a little bit wide and doesn't get such a good run. It's so intense, isn't it? As it just groups up, you can't really read how it's going to flow for either class. Absolutely. Well, we're on the final lap, disappointingly. The time has uh, gone by very, very quickly. Sam Neary will be hoping that this final lap goes by pretty quickly because he's being asked some serious questions now uh, by Johnny Adam behind him. Uh, Shul Gunon also trying to become a part of this battle but just can't quite keep up uh, with the group of cars ahead. Meanwhile, though, it is going to be, it would seem, another Barwell Motorsport victory at Snetterton. There's something about that team, Lamborghini and the Snetterton 300 circuit that gels so well. They've won both races in a day before with the same car of Barwell. Could they do that today? That would take a Herculean effort in race two, but both Sean Valve and Sandy Mitchell have driven superbly so far today. And as uh, Sandy brings the car out of the final turn, he will see the chequered flag and become the... Uh, fourth different car to win, sorry, third different car to win a race this season. Across the line goes Sandy Mitchell, Barwell victorious here at Snetterton, and he will be very happy with that. Now look in the background, that GT4 battle still raging on. They're still all in the same order, I think, aren't they? Uh, with the inclusion of the Ollie Webb GT3 McLaren. Around the outside, he will go of the Aston Martin, so it will be Seb Hopkins third in GT4. Freddie Tomlinson and Thomas Holland have already seen the flag first and second. A Raceway Motorsport 1-2 in GT4. And here comes that fight for the back end of the top five in GT3. Sam Neary's going to hang on, uh, actually, for a much-needed result, that, I think, for Team Aberration. They've had a trying season so far, and they'll be really, really happy to have made it into the top five. Yeah, really cool. We saw Sandy Mitchell winning overall. Then Tomlinson was actually right behind on track, so pretty rare to get the GT3 and the GT4 leaders on the same postcode at the end. That was good. Yeah, the Barwell guys are going to be super happy. Mark Lemmer there, as we uh, well know, one of the, uh, the strongest characters in British motorsport, I think, Again, a polite way of describing it. But, uh, yeah, those guys will be super happy. But as a pro, especially, your focus quickly switches to race two because that is only a few hours away. And they're actually going, well, what do I need more from the car? What do I need to improve on that, basically? And Sandy Mitchell will be starting P8 in that. So from hero, not to zero, you're still in the top ten, but suddenly it really does change the question of how the race will pan out 
for the second part of the day. Raceway Motorsport begin their celebrations then, a race victory and a 1-2 finish as well within the uh, GT4 ranks. Ginetta's looking strong here at Snetterton. They will have uh, a bit of a tougher job to do though later on because we'll still have two Ginettas inside the top four on the GT4 grid, but it'll be the two Toro Verde cars, not the two raceway cars. So those two uh, are going to have some overtaking to do if they're going to contest for more race victories. As, uh, as Joe was saying, will Sandy Mitchell, who will start that second race later on, into it as a race winner. So, Sandy Mitchell and Sean Bell victorious here at Snetterton for Barwell Motorsport. Darren Leung and Dan Harper come home in second place with Rob Bell and Mark Ratcliffe joining them on the podium. Lamborghini, BMW, McLaren at the front of the field. Not a Mercedes in sight. So Kevin Say makes it a, another McLaren in fourth place for Sky Tempesta Racing. Then you get the first of the Mercs with the Neeries for Team Abba Racing. First race with the Evo kit and they're in the top five. Johnny Adam and James Cottingham, sixth more valuable points scored. Seventh place for Ross Gunn and Andy, uh, Andrew Howard in Loggin, Jules Goon on eighth. John Ferguson and Raffaele Marcello ninth. And Mark Santam and Will Trigger after a difficult start to the race, managing to get back into the top ten ahead of Enduro, Orange Racing, Paddock Motorsport, Greystone GT, Race Lab, uh, both of their cars together actually at the end. Then it's Garage 59 who will be on pole, remember, for race number two. Marvin Kirkhoff will start uh, the 88 car from the front of the grid. Drive Tack 18th and Greystone GT 19th. Then we move into GT4 where Freddie Tomlinson and Stuart Middleton led that race where Motorsport Sport 1 2. Michael Kreese and Tom Holland claim another Pro Am class victory in second overall. Josh Miller held on to third for he and Seb Hopkins and are racing. Then the two century BMWs who got very close in the closing stages. Chris Salkel fending off Carl Cavers for fourth. Then it was Aston Miller and Josh Rowledge for DTO Motorsport. Optimums Jack Brown and Charles Clark were next. And the rest of the GT4 cars filing in behind. But it is Barwell Motorsport who celebrates a victory yet again in British GT. And for Sean Balfe and Sandy Mitchell there first victory of the year. They do become the fourth different winners from the first five races and Sandy Mitchell looks relieved I think after that one. He looked very nervous when we saw him in the garage early on and uh, now that relief starts to sweep over him there in the celebrations for Raceway. Stuart Middleton and Freddie Tomlinson uh, are both there in fact to uh, congratulate Thomas Holland on his second place and another Pro-Am victory within the GT4 Pro-Am Championship. Uh, it was Carl Cavers and Lewis Plato with the advantage. And in fact, that's a second victory of the season in that class for Michael Kreese and Thomas Holland, but they really needed it because they were the best part of 40 points off the Pro-Am Championship lead. Well, it will also be a handy result, this, for Barwa Motorsport in the GT3 Championship ranks. And down there with all of the reaction for race number one is Bryn Lucas. Well, Sandy, you've just seen Dan come over and congratulate you. That was a, a hot race, but a, a nicely managed race from yourself and from Sean from the front. Yeah, definitely. It's just one of those perfect races, really. It doesn't happen that often in British GT now. Um, you know, it's so competitive even this weekend. You know, Sean qualified right up the front and, um, you know, I was just a little bit off the pace and you find yourself back in P8 and uh, it could be worse. So, yeah, it's, it's ultra close between everyone and I think the key to, thing to that race was staying out of trouble and, being able to lead after the first corner made the difference and Sean had good pace to be able to pull away from P2 even if there was some faster guys kind of battling in the pack so overall it went really well. Great stuff, very very quickly a change of tyres, new tyres when you went out as well so that means you've used up one of your sets, what was I thinking there? Yeah I guess um, maybe with the gap we might have been able to, to not do that but um, good job. In the end, um, yeah, this morning we decided to kind of throw everything at race one, seeing as it's our best opportunity to win a race. And, um, yeah, it means that we're obviously going to have quite a big success penalty in the next race. So um, it's going to be difficult to get back on the podium there. So we just thought we'd throw everything at race one and we secured the victory. So that's the main thing. You chucked it and it stuck. Well done. Well done to Sandy Mitchell. Just saw uh, Sean Belf just there doing really well. Congratulations, Sean. Uh, nicely led from the start. Let's grab the guys in from GT4 then. Uh, Stuart Middleton led off the line and a brilliant, brilliant performance from both of you. Yeah, honestly, that was absolutely mega and uh, yeah, very well executed by the team there. You know, thank you so much to Jeanette and Raceway Motorsport. Everybody's done an absolutely fantastic job this weekend. Um, and yeah, you know, it's all been building up to this moment. Um, you know, in the previous races, uh, start of the season didn't really have the best of luck and um, yeah, it's just a few things went wrong. So 
yeah, you know, to come and uh, yeah, get this win is honestly, it's it's a, such a mega feeling. So no, thank you so much, everybody, and yeah, very well driven by this man as well. So, but this man who's just been doing exams all week as well, <laughs> so a slightly different um, test for you today. Yeah, I think I think I prefer this test more than the exams. <laughs> it, it definitely went better this time. So yeah, just happy to be here, and yeah, it was a great job by everyone. So just so thankful. Well, uh, enjoy this for the next few minutes because then you've got to focus on race two. Well done, both of you. Congratulations. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, uh, Bryn. Yeah, excellent reactions there from the uh, winning teams down in the uh, Part Ferme area and work already now starting to be done on some cars uh, for the second race a little bit later on. Well, fantastic opening race of the weekend here at Snetterton. Second race still to come a little bit later on. It was a race that was led from start to finish by Barwell Motorsport, having inherited pole position uh, after the penalty for the number four Mercedes, which had initially qualified at the front. It was a brilliant start to the race, though, for Sean Balfe. Held the lead into turn number one and never really looked back. Most of the action was happening some way behind him in the opening exchanges, uh, including this clash of the opening lap between Kevin Say and Matt Topham, who was making his GT3 class debut. It damaged the back of the Enduro car. Matt Topham was able to hang on nicely to a front-running position. Then contact uh, and Coram sent the number three Mercedes off along the grass. Mike Price rejoining after a spin at the back of the field. Another big moment there for the McLaren heading out onto the back straight. That allowed Darren Leung through into second place in the early stages. And the Century BMW was a factor all race long. Then into the pit window where the pit exit in particular became very, very busy indeed. And a couple of close calls led to some penalties for front running cars that really did jumble up the order. It was a relatively slow pit cycle at the end for Century Motorsports. So Dan Harbour had work to do to try and claw his way back up the order, which he did beautifully working his way past not one but two McLarens including this brilliant move on the inside of Chris Roggett to claim second place into Rich's corner. The FW man was on fire. He's become known this season for making some really good moves. However, his GT4 teammates were not exactly working well together. Lewis Plato into the back of Carl Cavers at the Wilson Airport, which briefly allowed Josh Rowledge back ahead in the DTO McLaren. There's something about Barwell Motorsport at Snetterton that just seems to click, and that continued again in the first race of the day with the number 78 car coming home victorious. So drivers then will make their way uh, up towards the podium area. And uh, as I said, for the teams, the attention already turning to race number two, which is due to get underway at uh, 4.20 this afternoon. So they've got a, a few hours to get the cars fettled and uh, fixed before that one. But uh, the teams who had a rough opening race of the day with quite a bit of work to do, it must be said. Speaking of quite a lot of work to do, it is going to take... Lauren Granville a long time, I think, to organise the podium. There's something about getting drivers gathered together, ready for a podium uh, ceremony that uh, just takes a little bit of time. It's like herding cats, quite frankly. All they want to do when they get out of the car is go and discuss with their teammate or their team how their race went on, go and have a chat with the driver maybe that they had a really good battle with out on track. Getting them all in the right place at the right time is not an easy thing to do, but Lauren does a great job behind the scenes uh, of organising all this sort of stuff. And we'll hopefully very shortly be able to get our... Uh, at least overall top three within the GT3 category up on the podium. The Neary's are going to be there as well within their class. Fifth place overall finish for them. But uh, around front runners and uh, Sam Neary looks happy, doesn't he? Chatting to Richard Neary. And they haven't had much to smile about so far this season, it must be said, but they uh, can be very, very happy indeed with that particular result. So we do then now start to get drivers up onto the podium. The overall top three within GT3, Optimum, Century Motorsport and Barwell Motorsport. Three different teams, three different cars represented in the top three positions at the end of that first race. But we have the same sort of story in race two later on. A huge congratulations, though, to Barwell Motorsport. Rob Le uh, Mark Lemmer and the team do know how to get a Lamborghini around Snetterton quickly. And is this now the start of them turning their season around a little bit? They're certainly not out of contention for the championship. They arrived here, uh, those two, a little bit further back than they would like to be. Sure, they were sixth in the points, 
they were, I think, 34 points off the championship leaders. But of course, they've outscored uh, Cottingham and Adam pretty healthily there, haven't they? They will take just the 12 championship points, the current championship leaders, whereas it's the full 25 that go the way of the Barwell team. So immediately that gap starts to come down a little bit. I think it'll only be about uh, 21 points now between them. Champagne sprays then on top of the Snetterton podium. A big crowd gathered underneath as well to join the celebrations. And uh, Dan Harper getting involved. I think there was a lack of fizz there for Darren Leung, but uh, thankfully the same could not be said about his driving, where he was really on his toes uh, in the early stages of the race. As Andy Mitchell uh, manages to get one over on his teammate there. And uh, Sean Valve, he's uh, been through a few podium celebrations in his time gets himself another British GT victory. So celebrations then continue on the podium. We'll hopefully now get our overall top three in the GT4 category up there next. And that's going to be a very Raceway Motorsport heavy affair with a one-two finish for the two Ginettas, uh, but joined up there by the R Racing duo as well of uh, Josh Miller and Seb Hopkins. Seb Hopkins in particular drove a really, really good second half of that race uh, to hang on to uh, the position. Michael Kreese always delighted, isn't he as well? He might be because uh, he, uh, along with uh, teammate Thomas Holland manages second place overall in GT4 and that's a Pro-Am victory as well. The win though goes the way uh, of their sister car after a flawless performance that from Stuart Middleton in the first half of the race uh, and then from Freddie Tomlinson in the second half of the race. They really were never headed. They came out of the pit lane just ahead of their teammate car and then simply disappeared up the road. So GT4 celebrations will now begin in earnest and uh, Michael Creason, surprisingly the first to pop the cork and uh, he will be extremely pleased with that result and as I started to say earlier on that will help them in their uh, Pro-Am championship endeavours too uh, because having not finished or not scored at uh, Donington last time out they were a little bit low on points so First race for the Intelligent Money British GT Championship here uh, at Snetterton was, uh, a, as always, an exciting affair. Race two kicks off at around about 20 past four with build-up for 10 or 15 minutes before that. Make sure you're back for race number two. <laughs> 